Hey everyone, welcome back. We've got another episode for you here, and this one I'm really excited about. I love upgrading computers and doing benchmarking and seeing things get faster, so that's what we're going to do this week. Let's get started first with some upgrade planning. So what do we got here? Well, if you remember from last week, we've got the Spark Station 10 architecture diagram. Top left corner, we've got the MBUS. That's where the CPU modules live. Right now, the system's only got a single 36 megahertz module in there. Top right hand corner, we've got the memory slots hanging off the memory controller. Still on the M bus, we've got 64 megs of RAM in there right now. Not really enough to run some of the later versions of Solaris. Lower right hand corner, we've got the S bus. The, right now, there's a GX graphics card in there. It's an accelerated graphics card, but it predates the Spark Station 10 by a couple years, and I think we can do a little better. Then we've got the, the low speed bus in, the, uh, in all the rest of the devices there. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a RAM upgrade. We're gonna bump that 64 up to 144 megs of RAM, which is plenty for running pretty much anything we're gonna be doing on the latest and greatest versions of Solaris that I would wanna run on this. And I'm talking by that, I mean sort of Solaris 7, Solaris 8 maybe at the latest. Then we're going to do the graphics upgrade. We're going to bump that GX up to a Turbo GX, which is a little bit faster. We'll be doing some benchmarking and we can show you some of the differences there. Then what we're going to do is a boot prom upgrade. It's running 2.12 right now. We're going to bump that up to the last version released by Sun, which is 2.25. And finally, the CPU upgrade. We're going to take our poor, lonely 36 megahertz CPU and bump it up to a pair of very fast Ross HyperSpark 150 megahertz CPUs. It's not the fastest configuration this boss box would support. That'd be about a four processor 200 megahertz configuration. But in that configuration, you've got to use external cooling. You got to cut holes in the case and do all this kind of stuff. The 150 modules run hot. You don't want to touch them after they've been running for only a few minutes. So this is about as maxed out as we want to get this thing for processor speed and still not, you know, have to cut holes in the case. All right, so let's go over some of the parts we're going to use. Here we got the existing Sun GX frame buffer card that came with it. Like I said, it's accelerated, but it's old. Here's the new Turbo GX. You can see the layout of the card's almost identical. There's a new RAM DAC. There's a new uh, ASIC. The amount of RAM is the same. Some new support circuitry. The improvement's not going to be huge, but there is actually going to be an improvement. It kind of gets a little bit interesting. Up next, we've got the RAM. Now this is just parts bin RAM. I don't even know where I got it. I don't know if it works. On the left, we've got a 64 megabyte SIM module. On the right, we've got a 16 megabyte SIM module, enough to bump us up from 64 to 144 megs. It doesn't have to go in pairs or anything like that. These are SIMs, not DIMMs. Up next, we've got some EEPROMs. You need to burn a PROM with this generation of Spark stations if you want to upgrade the BIOS or the Open Boot PROM. So that's what we're going to do. It's really cool. I love doing this. I didn't even know you could do this for, for years. I didn't know it was within reach. Finally, here's our CPU. 36 megahertz, ancient CPU, was released at the time of the machine's initial release in, I think, 1991. Oh, and we've got a friend. The Ross HyperSpark 150 megahertz CPU, an absolute screamer. We're looking at at least 2x the CPU performance, but like I said, we'll do some benchmarks and see how it plays out. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to upgrade the frame buffer card. Here's the old Sun GX board. As long as the screws on the back panel are undone, it's literally just a matter of lifting it up by the S-Bus connector and pulling the card out. It's really easy to upgrade cards. They're slightly fussy to get the S-Bus connectors lined up, but no big deal with a little practice and fiddling works out fine. And then a quick uh, power on test just to make sure that the frame buffer is working. Don't need to go into the OS or anything like that. But you can see it boots up here and we've got the standard uh, GX logo. So, so far, so good. Up next, the RAM upgrade. Now, I goofed and I must have had the camera turned off because I can't find the footage from this, but it's pretty straightforward. The service manual has an error in terms of the order that the SIMs go in, um, but I managed to figure it out and get them put into the proper banks. 
And as you can see here on the bottom of the screen, there's more RAM inside the system. A quick power on, and once uh, boot is through and we've got the initial screen up here, you can see that we've gone from 64 megs of RAM in the, the boot message here up to 144 megs of RAM. So, so far so good. And while I'm doing this, I'm monitoring the serial port on boot and I can see it doing all the RAM testing and it all looked fine. Okay, next we're gonna uh, flash a new prom for it. So we've got to pull out the frame buffer card. We already know it works. And then there's the two chips there on the left-hand side of the motherboard. Now the open boot prom is the top chip. The bottom chip with the orange sticker on it is the NVRAM chip and the time of day real-time clock. And so I'm just using a chip extraction tool. You can use a screwdriver if you want, um, but just remember the orientation that the chip goes in and try not to bend the pins. And so here you can see uh, this is the old prom. We're going to take this over with the prom burner to the uh, desktop and we're going to burn a new prom for it. So I've got one of these inexpensive, relatively, uh, TL866 and 2 Plus uh, prom burners. And we're just going to put the new chip in. And here we are in the software user interface. Now we've got to choose the right prom here. The prom that came with the system was a TI27C040, uh, I think. And once we find that uh, chip, we can read the old prom. Now I can't recommend this strongly enough. If you're burning proms, you're taking uh, EPROMs, ROM chips out of your computers, make a copy, make a backup. You never know if you're gonna screw something up and then you may not be able to get back to the same ROM revision or something like that if you put a chip in backwards. Trust me, I speak from experience here. So always make a, a backup copy of the prom. So what we've done is we've uh, selected the TI prom and we're just gonna read it out now. So um, it's pretty straightforward. You basically just click on read. It does an initial uh, check um, to make sure that the, the chip you've got inserted is the chip that it's expecting to see. Uh, and then it's going to basically download the contents of the ROM and then you can save it into a, a binary file on disk essentially. So if we take a quick look at it here, it looks kind of like garbage in the ASCII side. But as we scroll down, you can actually see that there's some of the boot messages and error messages we'd expect to see. So what we're going to do next is I bought from one of the online parts suppliers, I think it was DigiKey, some Atmel 27C040 chips. And we're just going to put it into the ZIF socket here. Same deal as last time, pretty much. All right. Now what I've got is I found online some old copies of uh, the Spark Station boot proms. Now there's two here. There's the Ross 2.25R prom, I could use that, or I could use the Sun 2.25 prom. Both of them happen to support the 150 megahertz processor. The Ross one is slightly different and will support even faster processors, but I went with the Sun version just for 100% compatibility and, and I've never really used it before either. So basically we've loaded in this ROM image and up next, we're basically going to uh, burn it to a new prom. Great. So I'm just selecting the proper Atmel prom. And you don't always have to have the perfect one. You can turn off the sort of uh, chip sensing one. I've had to do that before with an ancient Intel ROM chip. Um, but uh, basically it worked out. And then we're programming it through some very, very sped up video. I think this took about six minutes or so uh, to write this out. We're basically done. I just make a label so I can keep track of uh, what revision is, is in the computer in case it's powered off. And then we're going to basically take it back over to the computer. So we're back here and you can see the little notch at the bottom of the chip. I can't stress this enough. It's really important when you're installing these chips to get them in the correct orientation. If you install it backwards, whether it's a, a DIP package one like this or a PLCC one, you're going to basically destroy the, the prom as soon as you power it on. So we've got it in. Um, installation is pretty straightforward. You, you may have to bend the edges. Being a new prom, they're usually angled out a little bit. So you can just find a flat surface, surface and, and flatten them out. Um, no big deal. 
So the reason why we had to do this is the 150 megahertz processor isn't supported by that old 2.12 prom that was in there. And now you can see here, this is basically what I captured from the serial port on boot up. It's got a very different uh, printout than the previous prom version and you can see it shows up and it's now showing that the, it's got the 36 megahertz uh, TI processor in, no external cache. And yeah, it's a good sign. And basically it means the, the new prom is working. Okay, well, on to the final step here. We're gonna install these MBUS modules. We're gonna get these new processors, new in quotation marks, new processors installed here. Uh, and like I mentioned in the last video, uh, the, the connectors are keyed. They're extremely delicate with small pins and power connectors inside the MBUS connector, uh, but it's pretty hard to screw up. As long as you're, you're not too uh, strong and ham-fisted with it, uh, they'll go in okay. Um, and that's pretty much it. Once those are in, just make sure the back panels are on. You can do a power-up test here. Definitely want to monitor the serial port. We'll watch the, the prom monitor come up and tell us what we've got installed. Awesome. Here we are. We can see CPU 0 and 2 are our new HyperSpark 150 megahertz modules. And then it goes through quite a bit of testing. Just a, a word to the wise here. Uh, the machine now takes about five to six minutes to boot up. Um, it's running in enhanced diagnostics mode because the NVRAM chip is bad and, and this is a, a cold power on. Uh, but if you get one of these machines and you turn it on and nothing shows up, just be patient or even preferably connect a serial console to it, watch the output, use that to figure out what's going on. Don't just turn the machine on and say, well, no video comes out after a minute and assume it's not working. Anyway, great news. All our updates are done. Let's get doing some benchmarking. So here's the performance results. We'll go over it in detail because there's a fair bit to unpack here. So this is the first test that I did. I was using Solaris 7, using the disk that came with the machine. This was the original 36 megahertz single processor SuperSpark 1 processor. And you can see there's essentially no performance difference. The GX and the Turbo GX card performed the same at about 19 and a half frames per second in Doom using the uh, Time Demo Demo 3. So you can see here it was bottlenecked based on the CPU performance. They couldn't take advantage of any of the architectural improvements in the frame buffer cards. But let's move on to the next chart, which really shows that uh, that was a true bottleneck and there is a difference between all the different frame buffers. So let me back up a minute. What I had to do here is a little bit different. While I was testing using the disk that came with the machine running Solaris 2.7, it died. So what I did was I set up a netboot server. I used Solaris 2.6. Now Solaris 2.6 in Doom has slightly better performance than Solaris 2.7. So it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison between the previous slide, but it's close. Next, what I also did was I also compared the GX and the Turbo GX frame buffers to a CG3 frame buffer. Now this is an unaccelerated dumb frame buffer. It offers no special acceleration features. So really it's gonna be quite sensitive to just pure CPU performance. But what you can see is we've initially, just by going from single processor 36 megahertz to single processor 150 megahertz, we've improved our speed from 19 and a half frames per second to about, about 32 frames per second. So maybe slightly more than a 50% performance increase or around 50% if we account for the difference in the operating system. And what you can see is just using a single processor switching from the CG3 card, the dumb frame buffer, to the accelerated GX would go from 31 and a half to 36 and a half or so frames per second. So we do get a performance increase. And then moving from the GX to the turbo GX, we see a slightly smaller performance increase, uh, going from 36 and a half to 38.3 frames per second. So sure, some architectural improvements, it certainly helps in Doom, but um, it may not be telling the whole story for more desktop type applications or some type of 2D or 3D rendering applications, even though it's not a 3D card, but you can see there is still a slight performance increase here. 
You can also see the big performance increase in Doom if I use the dash MP flag and run it in multiprocessor mode. We get an almost, not a, certainly not a 2x performance increase, but you almost never expect to see a 2x performance increase. But we do see a, a significant increase, uh, certainly going from 38.3 frames per second to over 60 frames per second in the Turbo GX situation here. So definitely a big improvement in real-world performance and certainly the whole operating system, everything about the machine just feels enormously snappy with uh, the dual processor 150 megahertz configuration. It really is a different machine. If uh, if it was back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and there wasn't as much super rich web content, and we had a fast disk subsystem set up in this thing, it would be an absolute screamer of a machine, totally usable for day-to-day -day work. Well, everyone, that's all I've got for you today. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to upgrade this machine and get to know it. It played a really important part in Sun's history. It was their first desktop multiprocessor machine. And uh, it was incredible the amount of technology that they packed into such a small package. Uh, there's still more I'd like to do with this machine. I'd like to retro bright it. I'd like to uh, maybe get a SCSI to SD unit for it, maybe a 100 megabit Ethernet card for it, and certainly one of the external Sun speaker boxes for it to really kind of make it complete. Uh, but that's about it. Hopefully I can, I can play around with it a bit more, throw some apps on it. And I hope everyone has a great week and stay safe and we got lots more stuff for you to come on the channel thanks